let's kick this thing off by saying hello everyone and welcome to weather track smart water wednesdays um we have with us today chad sutton of gachina landscape hey everybody how you doing and it is an honor to have chad here chad was uh is a second time guest and was a guest on i think episode four or five so oh, you right. we're we're now almost to the 40s so we're keeping it real here chad thanks for uh thanks for continuing to support i think it's awesome to uh have this kind of kinship this relationship that we have that um allows us to provide good water management and talk about water management in a way that um, makes it real and makes it relatable for our listeners so yeah absolutely my pleasure ben i'm excited to be here thanks for, thanks the for being a part today we are going to i'm going to jump into my presentation oh just kidding not that far into the presentation um goodness all right so we're going to talk about flow link we're going to have chad sutton on the show today from gatina landscape who by the way has one of the greatest social media teams in all the business i love how much gatina uh puts out on social media and their perspective on not only water management but all of the great things that you guys do i think thanks shout out to your yeah. social media team shout out to chelsea Chelsea's the one who's really taken that to the new heights. It's it's really great. Uh, I've I've got it tracked on both Facebook and on LinkedIn. So, uh, and and the content that they provide is really really high quality. So, good job, Chelsea. Um, keep moving forward. So today we're going to talk about FlowLink, but I think the conversation about FlowLink really starts with the conversation about flow metering and flow management, right? Um, this is something that historically we haven't seen a ton of in your average everyday landscape. Uh, it's something that I called a designer feature where uh, you would only have it on professionally designed irrigation systems and beyond that uh, really only used in a very small handful of sites and in systems that had a professional manager. So. I would see flow management just wasted on a ton of irrigation systems, places where totally. flow sensors have been installed but never used. Do you see the same thing? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was like probably one of my biggest pet peeves of all time to go out to another beautifully designed, beautifully installed, but poorly executed after the fact management and maintenance of a system where this expensive flow sensor, expensive master valve, were there sitting in the boxes, but wires were never hooked up. Programming was never done. Flow was never learned. There was never anything to actually build off of. It was just, you know, just a waste of time and money. There's no value for anybody uh, who is either maintaining the system because they either didn't have the knowledge to execute and take it off, uh, you know, to the next level. Uh, and a lot of times I really feel like, you know, that performance thing is there's a lost step there where somebody's really not checking on who's actually taking it all the way to the point where it's actually up and running and working and being managed through a maintenance company. So yeah, huge uh, black eye for the industry. Totally, <laughs> and, and like I said, you know, it was used on sites that have that professional manager, those, Absolutely. those Rainbird MaxiCom sites that they have that full-time manager, but, um, uh, I'll carefully say we're partners with a big box retailer um, that we have thousands of sites across the country and they were specifying flow sensors long before they established the weather track relationship. Somebody high up saw the value in tracking the gallons, but it never translated to your point. It was left to the, the mow and blow guy to look at the irrigation controller and understand what that controller was trying to tell him about flow information, which almost never happened. Exactly, yeah. The, uh, if flow and flow alerts and the information just live inside the box and that's where you have to go to understand it, that's where I think the uh, whole notion of management fell apart because there's just not enough uh, resources put towards that level of management in a typical contract that's going to allow you to be there 
at that box all the time to get that information and react to it. So it really wasn't until the advent of cloud-based uh, real-time alerts that come through your email or your text or whatever platform you're on, that's, that's when things really started to happen and when Flow really started to offer the, the, the real value that was promised. Exactly, because when we combine the flow sensor and the information that the controller sees with that outreach aspect, that online cloud-based send you a text message when something goes wrong kind of mentality, then it's like having an irrigation tech on site 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We're not Bingo. relying on that Mo crew to, to understand and interpret that information. It's coming right to the right person uh, at the time that the incident happens. So we're not only saving gallons, we're saving a ton of headaches and providing proactive rather than reactive maintenance solutions. Yeah, no doubt. So I want to move toward flow link. So we got to get to uh, the conversation about adding flow, right? So before it was a designer project, uh, now it's something that you as a maintenance provider see the value in and are, I assume, offering to every customer or how do you decide who gets flow and, and when? So because the cloud aspect is so critical to have the information delivered to the right person at the right time, our, our primary prerequisite is that they're on a weather track or weather track like system first and foremost, um, because we don't want to go through the same issues that we just talked about with a non cloud based or real time, you know, um, management solution. So that's, that's the number one pre prerequisite. After that, it's all systems go because anybody who's got a weather track, I want them to have flow. The, the, the advantages are too many. And you know now is the time. And so with Flowlink, um, I really feel like a lot of those programs where we've had weather track but no flow, as soon as Flowlink got introduced, it, it opened up a slew of project for us because we were able to address all these issues that I know we're going to get into about why flow could not be installed on these retrofit systems. And that's primarily the world I work in, the Gachina Landscape Management is um, uh, it's like you know 80% maintenance and enhancement work of existing landscapes, maybe 20% new, and most of that new stuff is on existing properties, right? It's just kind of a refresh of a big area. So really for us, you know, dropping in new wires on a new site with our backhoe, no, never happens for us. <laughs> All right, so let me get to a, a quick explanation. So you've uh, brought up a great point. Um, let me dive into that a little bit. Chad has already seen the animation here. So um, I want to, I've made this little animation to provide a quick explanation of the value of Flowlink, um, what Flowlink is and what it does. And um, this explanation starts on a new build site, right? And out on a dirt lot, they've just put in this beautiful big building. And the last thing that ever goes in is the landscape. And so we go in and on that new system, we start at the water meter, which is often out on the corner of the property, right along the city access. So you find that water meter and you put in your backflow and your water source information or your devices. And then separate of that, the irrigation system controller is installed. And usually that lives on or in the building somewhere with that provides ease of access to the maintenance providers, right? Somewhere where you can turn that clock off when it starts to rain. And so when you are on this big dirt lot, trenching between the two is a simple task. Um, you definitely have to uh, wire in any components that you're looking to add onto this irrigation system. The wires have to run back to this controller. So you can add valves and you can add master valves and flow sensors with a relative amount of ease because it's easy to get all of the uh, requisite wires and electronic components all tied together, right? However, after that site is built, oh, I wired in my flow sensor. After that site is built, now we're looking at a site that has, in my example, a big parking lot in the way, 
right? And trenching across parking lots is no picnic. <laughs> so um, it really prevented us from going in and trenching in the proper wires for the flow sensor. So adding a flow sensor in after the site was already built was cost prohibitive. It, you know, th the features are great, but to pay tens of thousands of dollars to add those features to an existing system was really unrealistic. Right, Chad? Yeah, no, absolutely. That was the big non-starter was, uh, you know, I got sick and tired of having to go out and ask uh, asphalt, concrete, you know, demolition companies to get quotes on how much it would cost to go across this parking lot and give that number to my clients. And they, you know, it was like, are you kidding me? $50,000 to trench through a parking lot? You know, the, the numbers are astronomical. Not to mention that most of my clients can't even give me the time of day to get in there and shut down a parking lot to cut trenches and repair everything. So it's just really a non-starter. The money and the issues with, you know, site usage just made it unrealistic. Absolutely. Not it's, to mention, oh, we might have to go through roots and existing landscape. I mean, that's the other thing too. Every line I drew in the sand to say this is the path we would take went through at least four or five huge roots. And you know, every time an arborist would tell me, no way you're cutting that, it was like, well, it's not going to happen. Then because Let me dig that around that tree happen. root then, right? <laughs> yeah, trees that are in four foot wide planters, right? Where do you go around it? <laughs> right. And, and, and not just plant life or parking lots, but retaining walls or any sort of professional yeah. landscape. Uh, you're, you're talking about damaging, trenching through to provide this kind of feature. So uh, what Flowlink does is it eliminates the need to trench across those parking lots. What we do is we find the nearest valve out in the field that has been wired previously, right? In the construction phase, we wired all those wires together. And so there is a big bundle of existing wires that already goes underneath all of the parking lots and through all of the uh, obstacles that you would face in the landscape. And so what we did with Flowlink is we created a system we, where we could borrow the wires from an existing valve and tie in the flow link, use the flow link, which requires a, ah, just kidding, it's all wired here, a device at the controller we call the CT, and a device in the field that intercepts the wires from that valve and opens up the capabilities of running multiple devices on what used to be the two wire path that only managed that valve, right? So we borrow the wires from that valve and we add a flow link and open up the ability on that two wire path to add a flow sensor, a master valve and restore the operation of that existing valve. So we have all of the components wiring that we need to add that stuff without the cost of trenching across those parking lots. The best way I ever heard a contractor describe this, Chad, was mm -hmm. like, it's like an add a zone for a flow sensor, right? Yeah, exactly. That's all it is. It, it turns that two wire path into not only um, power wires, but communication wires as well, where we can handle all of the operation and information from of a flow sensor and master valve setup. Yeah, yeah, you and, certainly could have called it add a flow sensor and master valve. That could have been the name of the product. <laughs> exactly right. And all that is required, the only trenching then that's required is between that existing valve to where you install your master valve flow sensor, most likely right there at the base of your backflow. Yeah, and one little tidbit for anybody who's thinking about doing this, what we've found is, you know, we, we have pretty good toner, tracker, tracer, you know, like Armada Pro 900 units that can help us identify where the wires run. So we can tone them out and trace them. And a lot of times is what we find is, you know, the main line with the bundle of wires right underneath it is really close to our point of connection. So a lot of the times we can grab the wire that we need for the valve that we want to borrow the wires from. And we don't even actually have to trench to the valve itself. We just trench to what seems to be a lot closer because the main line usually runs right next to the backflow, right? That's common knowledge, right? Because that's the start of your main line. 
So usually the wires are somewhere right around your master or your uh, point of connection already. So you don't even have to go all the way back to the valve if you really start to think about find the wires that are out there. Yeah, and we have some upcoming slides, some good representations of different scenarios, right? We'll talk about that. Um, Aiden asked, uh, on a two wire system, do flow links, including the CT, uh, require a decoder? And the short answer is I wouldn't use this on a two wire system. Uh, if you're using WeatherTrack two wire, you can add flow and master valves right onto the two wire path. Um, and that's probably the easiest way. Uh, it wouldn't interface with the, the two wire system the way that you would expect it to um, because it's just an entirely different setup. This is really more of a conventional kind of wiring solution. Um, all right, so let's move on. The other point I have to make about this, Chad, is um, about the wire itself, right? We have a specific kind of wire that is recommended for traditional flow sensor installations. Um, and this is really compounding the issue of having to trench in wires, right? Because you can't, uh, in a typical scenario, just take existing or spare wires off of, of what's running with your main line just to add in a flow sensor because a flow sensor requires communication grade wire. We're talking about shielded wire that protects from electrical interference. And so even if you have spare wires like you referred to, uh, they're not really technically fit for carrying the communication that a flow sensor requires. They're very apt to picking up stray electricity uh, or electric electrical interference yes. that then shows up on the controller as flow. <laughs> yes, and, <laughs> and we've chasing experienced a flow that. problem that isn't flow problem. Tell me your experience. Yes, you know, we, we've tried to take shortcuts before and, uh, you know, a lot of it comes back to cost of running new wires. So, you know, we found a spare pair of wires that we tried to reuse one time for flow sensor, you know, the standard 14 gauge or 12 gauge, you know, solid. And, uh, you know, of course, every time you go buy an electrical transformer or some, you know, bollard that's high voltage, you know, a lot of those, a lot of those uh, times where we try to reuse regular wire to send flow sensor back, it just, it didn't work. We got all kinds of crazy bad readings, you know. Well, the good news is FlowLink eliminates that because what we have is uh, the, the traditional communication between the flow sensor and the controller is a, a pulse. Um, it's an electrical pulse that the controller hears, but the flow link is actually using a digital signal that is sent back and forth from the field to the, the controller transceiver. Um, and so electrical interference is no longer an issue. Um, so we can use those existing wires. And if you have accidentally uh, installed in a way that you're getting electrical interference, I've had flow link be the solutions rather than going back to the drawing board and just eliminating your flow sensor or trying to trench in new wires, just add a flow link. And that, that's exactly what we did on that site where we tried to reuse the existing wires directly to the flow sensor. We added a flow link and our problem was solved. Yeah, I've done that a number of times and it's worked every time. So yeah. uh, it's a great diagnostic tool as well. All right, so what we're gonna talk about is, um, Oh, I've got a question from Daniel. Can you use a flow link with one POC and multiple clocks? Um, the answer to that is, uh, depends on your clock. Uh, OptiFlow would do that 100%, but that's more of a control issue than it is a flow sensor issue. Do you understand that question the same way, Chad? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly possible. Um, you know, we, we've done flow link uh, and then, you know, share that across multiple clocks with flow share. So, um, you know, it's kind of a, you have to start adding flow links and flow shares to make it work as you expand out. It's kind of exponential, but uh, yeah. yeah, it's, it's certainly very possible, but yeah, for, uh, for those kind of situations, uh, OptiFlow XR is certainly the way to go. OptiFlow would make it easy, but it could be done using a WeatherTrack flow share or a very advanced series of relays. Could do, you could accomplish the same thing. Um, so it could be done, but uh, OptiFlow XR would make it easy to, to accomplish that. 
Um, all right, so let's talk about the Flowlink itself, right? This is a piece of hardware um, that <clears throat> installs. We've got this guy that lives out in the valve box. We've got the controller transceiver that you wire into uh, the controller. We've got what we call the EXT, which is you add to the intercept valve uh, or the valve that we're borrowing those wires from. And then we trench over to where we're installing the flow sensor and master valve. We wire the two wires that we just borrowed into these two blues. The two whites go to your master valve and the three wires um, go to your flow sensor. I've got a, a positive, a negative, and a power wire if you're using a photodiode. So again, another possible solution here is uh, oftentimes when people install photodiode registers, um, they only install two wires, which is something you get with the read switch. So if you've accidentally not installed enough wire for your photodiode register, Flowlink's a good solution for that as well. All right, so let's talk about the two different common scenarios. If we're adding flow onto a system. Uh, <clears throat> there's two real scenarios that I wanna discuss. If you already have a master valve, uh, you've already got wires that run right to where we want to, to add those components. And so the setup for Flowlink is a little different than it is if you have a system without a pre-existing master valve. Or to Chad's point, wires that run right where you want them to run. <laughs> if you've got wires running right by the, the point of connection, this is yeah. the solution for you. Could, could be a spare that you're gonna borrow that's could already be. in the ground that you're not using, so yeah. Absolutely, so uh, if you have wires that go there, we don't need that third component. We don't need that EXT because we're not gonna borrow those wires. We're just gonna use the wires that exist. And so this guy will, the, the FXT will just, uh, you can take those two wires, the shared common that runs through the entire system uh, and whatever spare wire that you have, whether it's the old master valve wire or something else would just wire directly back to the CT and you wouldn't need that EXT. So uh, if you have those wires in the right place, um then it can save you a step if you now the way that that works i pulled this documentation from our flow solutions guide right this is the way it looks in the field so we have the ct here wired into the controller um and then out in the field we had existing wire path that we added the flow link to we took the two wires off of the master valve wired them to the the FXT, and then I've got all of the necessary wires to wire in the components to manage flow right there at the point of connection. Um, this is also a shameless plug for our uh, flow solutions guide. We'll talk about that a little bit later. <laughs> um, the second scenario that we want to talk about is when you are borrowing those wires, when you, we have uh, I know it's politically incorrect, but I always call it the hijack valve, right? We're hijacking those wires, the borrowed wires. Um, if you have, when you need to find the nearest valve to incorporate this as a solution, we add the EXT. This device will sit in that valve box with that valve that you just found. So you uh, find that valve, you wire the two wires into the into the solenoid and that will restore operation of that valve. We don't lose that valve. We can still call on it, still use it for irrigation. Then we trench to where we're installing our flow sensor and master valve, lay down new wires in that trench, a two wire path that then we um, wire up the FXT that provides the power and the communication all the way back to the, or through the EXT back to the CT. And it just becomes this whole little network that operates all of the necessary components and tracks all of the information for a flow management project, right? And here's what it looks like, right? This is um, one scenario, the most simple scenario. We wire that up at the controller, steal these wires, trench this little path right here in between and add the FXT to where we're installing the flow sensor and master valve. Um, 
so the only it really eliminates a ton of trenching <laughs> and and makes um i have had folks that find the value not in in the eliminating expensive trenches but eliminating a ton of extra trenching like even if it's an easy trench there's yeah. a certain point at which it makes sense to do this anyway yeah exactly ben we look at it a lot of times even if we can direct wire, if it's gonna be a really long distance and very, very costly and it's gonna disturb plant material, you know, we always weigh the option of flow link of, against direct wiring and trenching. And a lot of times, even when we can trench successfully, flow link's the right solution because of cost savings and minimizing the impact to the existing landscape. And in our conversation earlier, you talked about the cost of that shielded wire, right? That's a, something that yeah. I, hadn't occurred to me that the yeah. shielded wire is an expensive thing. Yeah, it's gotten pretty expensive. You know, if you if you buy the name brand stuff that's shielded, jacketed, you know, it's got both the flow and the master valve and some spares in that jacket, uh, in that cable, it's, it's a very expensive piece of wire, you know, uh, upwards of a buck a foot. Wow. Well, uh, another thing to consider um, is the cost of that wire. You know what else? Um, I've had guys that um, that when you direct wire a flow sensor, there is a limited distance that that wire can handle. Um, the The specs say that you're not supposed to run a flow sensor wire more than two thousand feet, uh, or it will compromise the the signal as it travels. And the flow link uh, more than doubles that. Those, we've tested the flow link up over 4,000 feet um, because the signal was getting lost. So they presented flow link as a solution and it, it can really exaggerate the distance that that signal can travel um, by a good, good way. So that's especially handy for um, cities and, and projects that are just enormous, right? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's where we uh, sit medians where it's a really, really long run for sometimes, you know, from the point of connection to the controller for some reason, because water was at this end of the three mile stretch or whatever, and power was at this end. So yeah, we, we found good uses for that too. That's awesome. So um, we are running short on time here, Chad. So uh, I don't have much left, but I did want to highlight this. Uh, this is our flow solutions guide. You can download that from our website. If you're looking at um, trying to grapple with how to add flow onto a site, the flow solutions guide does a great job. Talks about how the, the flow link applications, flow share applications, which we mentioned, um, and just uh, walks through in a very visual way, um, kind of how we can start to present retrofit flow onto sites um, in an easy way that, that brings flow features into the conversation. So definitely check that out on our resources page at hydropoint.com. Um, I also have provided training for the flow link. It's not too complex, but it's nice to have somebody walk you through it the first time. So if you want to check out our certified training program on our Learn Upon site, there's a flow link training in there that will walk you through and get you comfortable before you go out the first time. I think that's also available on our YouTube channel, but I'm not sure. Um, if you're looking to sell this, if you want to talk about it with a customer, another resource that you'll find at hydropoint.com is the tech sheet. This is full of really valuable information and talking points um, that, that really kind of focus the conversation about the value proposition. Chad, you've used this, right? Oh yeah, all the time. It's a great way to help sell and explain to my team. Awesome. All right. And then... Sure. Um, and Just, that, in a nutshell, is my uh, the, the introduction into FlowLink. Now, I do have a couple of questions uh, that we want to pull off the chat box before we move on. I've got Aiden that says, can the FlowLink FX2 and the EXT work independently without a server? Um, not sure exactly what you're asking me there, Aiden. Um, if you're asking... Does it work when the controller is not online? Yes, it's totally independent uh, without the, the cloud connection. That signal is traveling through the wires. If you're asking if you could use this on another system that isn't WeatherTrack, 
uh, I would answer why would you ever use another system that isn't WeatherTrack? But um, technically, the 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 technology should work. Uh, it is not something that we would be able to support you on because our our customer service team speaks fluent weather track, right? When you call our customer service team, they'll ask you to, to walk through the steps on the weather track so they wouldn't know how to help you if you used it in a different scenario. But technically, I don't think that you're required to have a weather track to use this. And then um, Lynn asks, recurrent active alerts, valve short and valve no connect on our controllers. Um, are these alerts related to our flow link? Uh, it can be. Uh, if, if you are talking about, it's very limited in scope. It's not very common. But if you have an alert on the valve that you've hijacked, if you've got uh, your EXT wired into station three and you're getting an alert on station three, um, there definitely is an opportunity that the flow link could be causing that. One of the connections is most likely the cause, um, but there's a lot of wiring that has happened in between there. And if any of those connections fail, that can cause an alert, absolutely. I will add there. Add? Yeah, I will add there. It could be the master valve also, right? Because the master valve is part of that and you could get a short or no connect on the master valve as well. Yeah, absolutely. And Ben, one more, one more thing. I noticed we've got a couple more questions on the uh, chat, the actual chat. Oh, there we go. Okay, let me go there. So I am out of Q&A. Stop. There's chat. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, let's go. Is this applicable for conventioning? conventional wiring as well? Yes, absolutely. It is designed for a conventional wire controller. Um, if I said it makes a two wire path, it's kind of the same idea. The, the two wires of your conventional system, we turn them into communication and power wires like on a two wire path, but this is designed for a conventional wire system and a conventional wire solution. And then is it possible with one OptiFlow XR manager and, and Pro3 members or all OptiFlow? Absolutely. Any In the OptiFlow setup, the only controller that has to be a, a XR is the one that listens to the flow sensor. The rest of them can be Pro 3s that have that OptiFlow key installed um, that make them member controllers. So anything that is listening to the flow sensor, whether it's through Flow Link or not, has to be an XR. But then that, and that XR can share that flow information to the other members, whether they are OptiFlow XRs or Pro 3s with the upgrade key. Anything to add on that, Chad? No, no, it's definitely all possible. Um, can I answer the next one? I think I know this one. Yes, please. What's the difference between Flow Link and OptiFlow? Okay, so Flow Link is hardware that is designed to just get the master valve control and the flow sensor information back to your controller. So that's what Flow Link is. OptiFlow is a software based solution. It does come with a new controller, the XR controller. So you can get it, this software with that controller, but OptiFlow optimizes your available gallon per minute or your supply and can optimize that across one controller or multiple controllers on a team that are sharing that information and turning on valves in the right sequence so that you can fill up and use as much of that pipe as you've got. Perfect. I think uh, uh, I would just say simply FlowLink is a device that helps us hear the flow back to the controller. OptiFlow is a much larger proposition where it's an operating system flow management in the cloud. So absolutely. There's one more question from Lee at the very top of the chat here. Does, right. does FlowLink work with the Flow HD, Ben? Oh, yes, 100%. Absolutely. Um, yeah. It is the same type of signal. Um, it, and the only thing you have to be cautious of is the K and offset values for your flow HD are dramatically different than your standard flow sensors, but it works just the same. Yes. All right. I think that's uh, that was great round of questions. I think this is the most questions we've had on that chat and Q&A box. So Chad, you are prompting good conversation. Ha! Uh, it's, it's a good topic. That's it. There you go. Um, so now I am going to 
let's finish the PowerPoint real fast. So we're always here to help. Check out our online support resources. Uh, next week, we are going to feature two-wire troubleshooting. Um, so tune in next week for two-wire troubleshooting class. Um, it's an interesting topic, and we'll have a great water manager, Justin Shelby, join us for that. Um, all right, chat. You're a second time guest and my second time guests all get the same question. What is your favorite weather track feature? Uh, that's a good question. Um, there's a ton. Um, I'll just go with a simple one that has been around a long time, but it's super valuable. Runtime valve test. Okay. Run, runtime valve test. I mean, the difference between knowing that a valve solenoid is shorted or there's no connection anymore because it's completely dead the ability just that simple ability to get real-time updates on how your wiring path is and how your solenoids are doing before the whole zone starts to dry out and you're in crisis mode panic mode that feature runtime valve test and how it's changed us from reactive to a proactive maintainer has made a huge difference. That feature alone being in the cloud and delivered out to all your different platforms, all your different devices, the right person, the right time, that thing's been a real game changer. And uh, it's an oldie, but a goodie. Absolutely. Uh, Great answer. Uh, and I would say when you combine it with the cloud, finding those issues are, um, are, easy on the day after it happens right if you've got a broken wire it's because somebody put a shovel through your wire if right you get that information the next day you can go out and find where they were digging you exactly don't get that information till a week or a month later those tracks are gone and it adds yeah. to the time it adds to the the whole process and yeah i'll just the expense of fixing it yeah, I'll just conclude with that. Um, property managers love when you can show them cause and effect when an issue happens. So if we can see that the wire's broken in the morning and we can get out there that same day and still see the guy who's putting in the real estate sign, digging the post hole right through the wire and say, excuse me, sir, you're gonna have to pay for this damage. Property lovers, uh, property managers love being able to, you know, make sure that the person responsible is held accountable rather than just keep picking up the tab over and over again. So pretty nice for everybody. Absolutely. Chad, it has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for making time for us this morning. I really always appreciate not only chatting with you in this forum, but it's always good to see your face. Thanks, Ben. It was good to see you too. Thanks for having me. And thanks everyone. We'll see you next week for Two Wire Troubleshooting. Have a great week.